So I'm originally from Arizona, um, so it's a really great pleasure to be out here. Um, I grew up in a little town called Globe, Arizona, which is about two hours uh, just due east of here, and it's a copper mining town. So I just, for all of you that this might be your first visit to Arizona, just welcome to the state that I'm from. Um, I'm also super honored to be here with Andrea. So I started working with Andrea when I joined the Piedmont Transplant Institute in 2014. And Andrea is a nurse practitioner who has experience not only with the transplant side of things, but also with dialysis. So I'll let her do her introduction, but she uh, spent years in dialysis as a nurse before working at Piedmont as a nurse practitioner. And the way that we do it at Piedmont is that the physicians take care of transplant recipients for the first three months out from transplant. And then from four months until they're released to their local um, nephrologist, our nurse practitioners take care of them with discussion with the physician if there's anything you know, acutely different with the transplant course. And I've grown to really, really respect Andrea. She has a lot of knowledge about long-term care of the transplant recipient. And she's just a super caring nurse practitioner uh, that takes excellent care of her patients. So to be on the podium with her discussing this is really a pleasure. Uh, Andrea, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. Oh, I might be a little loud here. Um, I don't know what I could follow up with with that generous, in, generous introduction, but I feel the same way about Dr. Klein. Uh, we've been working together for many years, and I am really, um, really excited to be here to represent uh, Veloxis. Um, I think this um, the statement has probably already been made, but I do want to let you guys know that uh, financial compensation from Veloxis Pharmaceutical has been provided um, before we carry on with our, um, our endeavors today. So this, um, this presentation is really going to, um, it's really going to speak to us and to you about how we're going to improve ad adherence with our patient population. Um, okay, um, so with many of our patients and our graphs now surviving longer than one year, um, and really uh, most of our uh, kidney transplants are I mean, I don't know about you guys, but in, in our practice at Piedmont, we have patients that are now surviving and their grafts are surviving even longer than five, 10 years. We have some patients that are even out 20, 25. I actually have a patient now that is out 32 years from transplant, uh, which is wonderful. But as our continuum of care goes out that far, we also have to take our focus to dealing with some of those long-term care issues. Um, we need to um, think more of not acute rejection, but acute rejection and some of the other long-term care issues for both allograft survival and for the survival of their long-term care as well, such as um, you know, uh, hypertension, comorbidities, uh, how are we going to help them not only have their graft survive, but help them with their own personal other issues to help them survive as well. Are we, um, are we monitoring their uh, hemoglobin A1C? Are they um, having all of their cancer screenings done? How are we going to help them get to a place where not only is their graft surviving longer than one year, but they are surviving longer than one year as well. So when we talk about having our patients um, and their graft survive longer, uh, post-transplant care um, really aims to optimize that. Uh, we see that all the time, right? We all have to live up to the UNOS rules, correct? Everybody wants to get to one year. Everybody wants to get to three years especially, correct? Everybody's cheering when you get to that third year. Um, but our, our folks, thankfully, are, are living much longer. Um, we're, uh, you know, minimizing the risk of immunosuppression. And we pretty much all know what to do post-transplant. Everybody's pretty much doing the same thing. You know, making sure that they get to that three-month mark, uh, that six-month mark. Intermediate care, um, we prioritize, prioritize maximizing graft function. 
uh, preventing acute rejection, preventing uh, any opportunistic infections. But once we get to that long-term care uh, process within their uh, transplant, um, plant, transplant course, our, our care or our thought of care shifts. Once they get to greater than one year, we, sorry, I move a lot when I'm talking. Once we get to that greater than one year, our thought process and how we care for a patient tends to shift to help that patient during their long-term course. We want to maximize their graft. We want to max maximize the function and survival. We want to not only make sure they have your, their immunosuppression, but we, we want to optimize it now, right? We don't want them running around with a, a trough level of 20 when it's supposed to be four to six. Um, we want to mitigate any adverse events like infections, complications, um, any of that associated with immunosuppression, swelling, um, hypertension. And we also want to make sure that we're, un that we're also um, introducing lifestyle changes that's going to help that patient um, have that graft survive longer and have an optimal quality of care. We want to make sure that we're giving our patients all the tools in the toolbox to be able to survive and to be able to get everything they need. Um, it's, always, it's always funny to me when I see patients that have their graphs, you know, longer than 10 years when you ask them, and I know you guys probably do the same, so what are you doing? What are you doing different? And they're like, most of the time, the, the best response you ever get is, well, I take my medicines, I take them on time, and I get my labs done every other month. I mean, that's, that's, pretty much, that's pretty much the answer you get. Um, but when you don't get that answer, you know, most of the time there's going to be issues. So it's, it's nice to have those patients out there that, you know, really get that. So when you speak to non-adherence, we need to figure out what we're going to do to help our patients stay on time with our medications and to be able to make their life longer and their graft function longer. So once at Piedmont, I think as Christina mentioned earlier, they see the patients from transplant to three months. After three months, as long as there's no complications and they're stable, then the patient uh, transfers over to the care with the nurse practitioner. Usually from three months to one year, we follow up with the patient. And I know some transplant patients will be discharged to their primary care or PCP sooner, depending upon the center. But at our center, we um, will continue to see those patients most often up every month or every two to three months until they reach that year point. At that year point, we're starting to think about how are we going to transition these patients back out to the community, to their PCP, to their community nephrologist. Well, now remember, we just said, you know, we're keeping our patients longer, they're surviving longer, we've gotten great at managing immunosuppression. So we want the outside community to be able to help us take care of these patients. That's going to be an integral part of how our patients live longer. So we want to be able to foster a patient-centered approach with the primary care doctors, the uh, nephrologist, we want to be able to bring them under our wing per se so that they can know exactly what to expect and exactly what they need to uh, bring the patient back in if they want to. And I know a lot of times we get into this, you know, um, and, and, and I've done, I, I'm bad about this as well. You know, you, you get into this thought, well, I mean, why didn't they send them back sooner? I mean, shouldn't they have known that? Um, I mean, we all do that, but you have to think, uh, just in the state of Georgia, there's two major transplant centers. Well, let's say we do 400 kidneys a year, both of our transplant centers. Well, that's only 800 kidneys just in the state of Georgia. How many of those kidneys dispersed around the state of Georgia are really seeing a nephrologist or a primary care physician, and how many of those providers really have a ton of experience with transplant patients? I would factor to say not as much, not, not many. So we have to be the people that, um, that foster um, education and good care to the providers that are seeing those patients.
Um, so let's, let's just, I, I guess we should probably pose this question. How does your team work with community nephrology practices to coordinate long-term care for tr renal transplant recipients, and what are some of the best practices to ensure smooth collaboration with community nephrology practices? And I'm going to let Christina kind of tell you what we do at Piedmont, and then if you guys would like to chime in, that would be, that would be fabulous. All right. So over here we have a gentleman with a microphone, and if anyone wants to also contribute, definitely looking for your input as well. We want this to be as kind of collaborative as possible because by no means am I an expert. I constantly learn from experience. Um, but I'll start off with the answer to this question. Um, from our perspective, what I love about Piedmont and of course, we are in the South, so it's a lot of relationship building, you know, just meet, meet and greet with people. But Piedmont, when I joined, had a strong focus on the, the transplant nephrologist doing outreach to the local nephrologists. And it encompasses, we not only transplant individuals from Georgia, um, but also from Alabama, Southern Tennessee, um, rarely the Carolinas, sometimes Northern Florida as well. And there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, but what I realized was um, that it was just essential. And what I was told was, you will be giving your cell phone number to the nephrologist when you do outreach with them. And every single nephrologist in our state at least has one of our transplant nephrologist phone number, and most of them have all. So when we go, we actually give them our colleagues' phone numbers, and we say, if you're running into a problem with a patient, if one is hospitalized, we want you to call us, you know, maybe to coordinate transfer or just to help you manage care of that patient if they stay locally hospitalized. And, you know, it was really trying to build this collaborative network with our referring doctors that was a little bit different from the previous transplant centers that I had been at. Um, so definitely, I think that building those relationships and going out to practices, meeting people, you know, one-on-one -on -one and not just through a phone call um, has been critical in helping to manage the long-term care of our, our patients. And um, I'll kind of pass it along to you. If you could just do a brief introduction of yourself as well. Sure. Um, <coughs> Muhammad Yaqub from uh, Indiana University. So I believe that the transplant patient has to be seen long term by the transplant center at least once a year. We, we send most of our patients back to their referring nephrologist. We have outreach clinic in uh, Indiana at seven different locations. We, we go there once a month and then we see long-term transplant patient at least once a year. Because we still see patients who we sent five years ago, TAC, TAC level running eight, and uh, creatinine slowly creeping up one, three to one, four. No one cha has changed their immune suppression with multiple skin cancers. So I believe that transplant center still has to be involved in the care of transplant, uh, transplant patient to improve long-term long -term outcomes. Mm -hmm. I know that one of the things that I've learned from just talking with colleagues at other centers is that it really differs on the time point at which patients are released to their local nephrologist for follow-up care. Some centers do follow long-term as long as the graft functions, um, at least on an annual basis, and then some centers are uh, more apt to release a transplant recipient to the local nephrologist care and then be involved in the patient's care of something does change along the way. So at Piedmont, we changed a little bit so that at five years, if they were stable and established with a local nephrologist, they would be released to their care. And then there was a specific group of reasons why we told the patient as well as the nephrologist if any of these things happen, we would like to see them again. For example, pregnancy, a cancer diagnosis, um, problems getting their medications, anything like that. So we actually gave the patients as well as the nephrologist a list of things that we actually we really wanted the patient to be reconnected with us if those things occurred. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Fisayo Adebi, also from Indiana University. Uh, I think the other thing to keep in mind is the how comfortable the local nephrologists are with transplant patients. There has been situations whereby a lot of local nephrologists even within their practice, always say to their patients, once you are transplanted, you stay with your transplant program. So we have to know those 
groups that are not comfortable, even if we try to teach or educate. And secondly, is the aspect of the patient. There are patients that even though there are attempts to refer them back to the local nephrologist, refuses to go back to their local nephrologist. Yes. So, um, it's going to be one-on-one -on -one approach. You will really need to continue to educate local nephrologists, but like my colleague said, there will always be a need that the transplant center maintains interaction with this patient in a very specific, timely manner, rather than leaving everything to the local folks just for the purpose of education. Thank you. Absolutely. And one other thing that we recently discovered um, was that if somebody was having difficulty with their immunosuppression and they had been following with their local doctor, sometimes they would call their old dialysis clinic and ask to speak to the social worker about getting medications, which was kind of a surprise to me, but some patients had been on dialysis for a long time, had that relationship there, and the dialysis social worker might not know about patients' assistance programs or like Georgia Transplant Foundation, the ability to help them with co-pays of medications like our transplant social workers. Um, so definitely, I think that to your point, you know, every patient is an individual and you have to do what's right for that particular patient and maintaining the line of communication, um, not only with the nephrologist, the patient, but also other people that they might reach out to, such as a dialysis social worker. Yes, sir. Hello. Hi, my name is Drew Silverman. I am a transplant pharmacist, been in practice for about 36 years and I'm a two-time kidney recipient. It will be 38 years this year. <clears throat> I am heading on year 22 with the second and doing very well, and I am gonna say it was because I do take my meds, right? I better. Um, and I'm just gonna say maybe it also has something to do with the fact that my transplant nephrologist got to see me every day. <laughs> um, so there are a couple, there, this is a complex issue, some of the issue is the relationship you have with that patient when you send them back, right? Because they now get mixed messages. Who, if I'm having issues, who do I talk to? My PCP, my referring nephrologist, when I call my center, what kind of a message do I get from my center? Oh, yeah, your PCP will handle that. And they can't discern, determine which things they should go to their PCP for, which things they should come to their center for. Second, years ago, I went, to the Midwest Blue Cross Blue Shield region to talk to their um, case managers. And they told me that Blue Cross believed that PCPs and local nephrologists could manage these patients just as well as the transplant center. And this is why they drive some of that where you have to send your patients back because they won't pay for them to come and see you long term. Mm -hmm. And then the last issue is <clears throat> we've seen this with COVID, right? How many patients have you had that got put on Paxlovid and ended up with some kind of a serious issue because it wasn't communicated to the transplant team, right? right? So we teach them that when we send them home. We give them a book that tells them, anytime you get a new med, let us know, right? They're not going to remember that three, four, five, six years down the road. Um, but two things, the ability to maybe use telehealth to see them more frequently how will insurance companies deal with that? Because they probably don't have to pay as much for that, and it may be beneficial, but we still have to show that. And the second thing is, the coordinators don't have time to make phone calls to all 500 patients that they follow to remind them of these things. But we can use other forms of technology, if they have email, if they have a smartphone, to send tickle reminders periodically. If you are on new meds, it's important you let us know because there could be drug interactions that could be dangerous for you, right? Yeah. So there are lots of different ways that we can work with those patients to help them navigate something that they're not prepared to navigate when they go home from their transplant. They're overwhelmed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of those comments. All right. So, I, I have, oh, yes, I have sir. a question <clears throat> concerning transferring back to the, the local nephrologist. Uh, I'm Tom McCune from Centera Norfolk General Hospital, and I'm a transplant nephrologist. Um, one of the problems we've had recently is we've been using a lot more bilatacept. And with that, when we send patients back to their community nephrologist, they balk and send them right back because they don't want to handle an infusion drug. How are you de dealing with that? Right. So 
that, that is tricky. Um, and sometimes when, to the point of the gentleman at your table, um, if truly the local nephrologist cannot manage an aspect of a patient's care, we will adopt that aspect of care because we want them to have a successful transplant. So, um, for example, IV infusions, we identify centers um, that are able to provide near the patient's home and we would work through that on a case-by-case -case basis. But there's just certain groups, like if they need an IV infusion, um, if they were a kidney pancreas patient and you know their pancreas is still functional but their kidney failed and they're on dialysis, we're still gonna see them for their immunosuppression for their pancreas transplant. Definitely there's patient populations that you're not gonna be able to transition fully um, to their local caregiver. All right, so moving on, just kind of thinking again about this kind of transition or this continuum along the transplant patient's interaction with the transplant center, you know, it usually begins at the referral stage. So we see people for a kidney or a pancreas transplant evaluation, but they're still primarily under the care of their local nephrologist. So either at the CKD clinic or at the dialysis clinic. And it's a really important uh, time point though, because it's the time at which we start to generate that idea of co-managed care. So at the time before transplant, primarily their local nephrologist is gonna be taking care of them, but they also have this communication with the transplant program to get the evaluation, all the listing requirements done, be on the list, maintain their status as active on the wait list, and ultimately get a transplant. And so we, you know, when I'm doing evaluations, and Andrea is in the post-transplant side, but I do a lot of pre-transplant evaluations, and I like for the patient to kind of get that sense that I know your local nephrologist, I appreciate the fact that your nephrologist has sent you to us, kind of give them really good ideas of what we're gonna do on the pre-transplant side and what the nephrologist is gonna do, and encourage them to talk to their nephrologist as well as their coordinator if they feel like they're running into any sticky points on the pre-transplant side. The immediate care section, I feel like most transplant centers take care of everything in the first couple months out from transplant. So if the patient needs a refill on anything or you know the, the anti-hypertensive medications, not so much diabetes, that tends to be kind of in conjunction with endocrinology or the PCP, but we actually end up managing a lot for patients in the first zero to three months out from transplant. And then the transition point, and everybody, of course, every center has a different transition point, I think it's really critical to think about how that's gonna be done well. So for example, labs. You know, if I have a patient that in, immediately out from transplant, they're getting all their labs done at Piedmont, and then they're like, well, I used to get my labs done at my local nephrologist's office. I wanna get them there, because that's a mile away from my office. So how are we gonna make sure that they get their labs drawn and that we get the results as well as their nephrologist, and who's gonna follow up on what? And that's when it gets really tricky, right? Because you want to make sure that every, the information is given to everybody and that the appropriate management is done. Um, as well as patient records. So we use Epic, for example, and you know when I first arrived at Piedmont, not a lot of places around Georgia were on Epic, and now more and more hospital centers are on Epic, and it's been amazing because we actually have all these nephrologists that are at other hospital systems, and they're like, we can see your notes now, you know, because fax machines are not perfect, and not all the time is a person going to read what they received on a fax machine anyway for maybe even several weeks, they might even not see it. And so just having that ability to really communicate effectively definitely improves patient care. Um, and then long-term care, you know, I think that Andrea alluded to a lot of things, but when we see people, or when Andrea sees people, I should say Andrea, um, you know, making sure, in her notes it always says, if the person has cardiovascular disease, she actually asks them, are you seeing your cardiologist? Are you seeing your endocrinologist? Like she focuses on all of those things that I might not focus on immediately out from transplant. Um, so this kind of just gives a, another version of how our priorities are different depending on the time out from transplant. And I think the first 30 days, it's all about graft function, right? So what's the creatinine trend? Do they have DGF? Are they coming off of dialysis? Let's get the, the drug levels and the doses appropriate. And then from one to 12 months, a continued focus on the allograft function, and also as they come off maybe CMV prophylaxis, making sure that they don't develop CMV viremia or other opportunistic infections. And then for children, focus on growth and development. And then out, after 12 months, 
the kind of focus, of course, a change in creatinine is going to prompt attention, but the appropriate focus shifts more towards, you know, what is going to not only help that allograft last longer, but that patient live longer, you know, and of there's a big overlap in that, right? So if we manage diabetes, we're going to prevent early diabetic nephropathy in the allograft and probably also cardiovascular complications down the line for that recipient. So the focus is changed, and I think that I'm going to say this about myself. You know, I focus much more on the graft and the immunosuppression sometimes than I would focus on kind of the long-term things that actually make a difference in long-term graft function as well as just how long a patient's going to live with that allograft. So, Andrea, because you are more of our long-term management um, at Piedmont, what do you think are key touch points for monitoring graft and patient health after transplant? And what do you feel like is appropriate for the transplant program to take care of versus the community nephrologist or maybe other care providers for that patient? And, and other people, please, for any of the question slides, please feel free to raise your hand. We love your input as well. Yes, please chime in. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys what we kind of do at Piedmont. Um, I think it works, it, it works well. Sometimes it doesn't. No, nothing's 100% right. Uh, but for the most part, I think it works well. So when the nurse practitioners see the patient and they, um, we, we think that they're stable enough or their graph is stable and can be discharged out to their PCP or their nephrologist, one of the things that we do is, um, well, first of all, um, our wonderful pharmacist, one of them is here today, Rose, uh, she's fabulous. Um, they do pillbox checks, at, pill box checks at different intervals from transplant to one year. Um, so that is helpful because not only do they teach the patients what their medicines look like, what the, what the medicine is for, um, and when and when they should not stop their medications, but it also helps the patient take control of their own medications, right? Um, the other things that I think um, and that we try to do at Piedmont is, and most, most I, I think everybody has something like this or similar, we have a post-transplant care booklet that goes home with our patients. Um, now, granted, when you're first transplanted, um, you get so much information that it's, that it's patient overload. But just about every time they come in to see one of us, um, we're always, they ask us a question and we always are like, did you look in your orange and white book? Most of the time the answer is no. Well, that gives us an opportunity to drag out the old orange and white book and say, well, this is, you know, the medications that are safe for you to take over the counter. This is when there's a problem that you need to call us, et cetera. Um, when we discharge them, though, or we think they're able to go a year or six months without seeing us, one of the things that we do is we, uh, on Epic, it's really easy, um, we have a smart phrase that we dump into their after-visit summary, and we actually talk to that patient, and we tell them, okay, your baseline creatinine is 1.1 to 1.3. And then we calculate what is 30% above 1.3. Give the patient the number. If your creatinine is ever above 1.6, you have to call us. Call us, you know. You're getting your labs done in an outside office. We want you to be in charge of what your creatinine should be. We also give them other parameters like your trough level, if it's done 12 hours after your last dose, should be four to six. If it's not, and there's a concern, call us. Um, we want you to call us back if you have been diagnosed with cancer, if you're thinking about getting pregnant, if you have protein in your, in your urine. I mean, all other different kinds of things. If you run out of medicine, um, our social workers will help you. Um, and we also make sure that they are discharged with a year's worth of their immunosuppressant medications. We also give, uh, give a call to the nephrologist to let them know what we're doing. Um, and one of the things that I think is helpful, I mean, I tend to, when I'm in, a, in an emergent situation, I tend to forget my kids' birthdays and sometimes my own. So what I say is, you know, take a picture of this, 
put it in your smartphone because you're going to end up in the ER and you're not going to remember any of this, but you're going to have your smartphone with you. So you can flip back through this and when they say you have to go to see a nephrologist immediately because you're in kidney failure, your creatinine is 1.6. You can say, oh, no, 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 no. Nope, this, this right here. Andrea told me that's where my creatinine is supposed to be. And that takes a lot of stress off them because they know that, you know, oh my God, my kidney's not failing. I I'm okay. I'm just, you know, maybe it's just a strain from a groin injury, you know. So that's helpful to them as well. Um, anything I missed? Anything you guys want to add? Okay. All right. So when you think about adherence and um, or when you think about long-term graft survival, on this slide we listed some immunological fat. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did you have a comment? Yeah. Hi, Deepak Mittal from Chicago. Uh, great talk. What is your favorite immunosuppression protocol for somebody who wants to be pregnant? I know you stopped the cell sep. Um, is it enlarges um, and steroids, or what do you guys do? Right. So I would be. Happy to talk about that with you after. I think just because we wanted to keep this um, a non-branded talk, we wanted just to avoid specific uh, immunosuppression conversation, if that's okay. Um, but after the talk, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so when we think about long-term graph function, there's immuno immunological factors on the left and non-immunological factors on the right. And on the slide in green, we put the factors that can really be modifiable. So either by the transplant center or the local caregivers, you know, what is it that we can do to promote long-term graft function? Um, things that are associated with decreased long-term graft function would be suboptimal immunosuppression, non-adherence, sensitization, increasing the risk for rejection, um, definitely comorbidities. So I've already mentioned diabetes if it's uncontrolled. You know, really, you can see diabetic nephropathy very early after um, kidney transplantation, uncontrolled hypertension, and then drug-drug in interactions, just like Drew mentioned with the Paxlovid um, issue. And we circled non-adherence just because, as we'll talk about this later on in the talk, non-adherence is just a huge impact on long-term graft survival. So what is adherence? And adherence is the extent to which a patient's behavior matches the agreed upon prescriber recommendation. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I heard in a talk one time, and it was so impactful, was that a lot of non-adherence is non-intentional. So we get frustrated with the non-adherence that's intentional. You know, the person that's just like, I don't care about taking my medicine. You know, they just have that kind of attitude and they're just, it, it, they know what they're supposed to do and then they just don't do it. Um, but when you think about it deeply, there's so many areas in which non-adherence can happen that's non-intentional. So for example, dosing adherence. You know, if you're supposed to take three tablets twice a day, so what if a person knows that they're supposed to take three tablets twice a day, but then the pharmacy fills it with a different milligram size tablet. So they're still taking three tablets twice a day, but they're actually taking a half dose because the dose got different from the pharmacy, right? So that's really complicated, actually. You have to not only know the number of pills, but your milligram dose and the twice a day regimen. Um, there's taking adherence, so not missing a dose per day. So what if you're flying from here to Japan? So what are you supposed to do with your medicines? Are you supposed to stay on your home schedule? Are you supposed to be on their schedule? Or what do you do? Um, stuff like that. Holidays can be get kind of confusing. A lot of people are doing a lot of stuff and they might just forget their medications when they get super busy. Um, timing adherence is something that I think is um, important to focus on right after transplant because we give our medicines at six in the morning, six at night in the hospital. And I've had so many people tell me that they miss their medicines because they try to do the 6P, 6A regimen at home, and then they just don't happen to wake up by 6 in the morning, um, and then they miss it. And I'm like, no, you have to choose the 12-hour regimen that works for you, right? Because if you won't remember it, you're never going to take it right. And they're really amazed by this. They're like, well, I thought I had to take it 6 in the morning and 6 at night. No. Um, and then persistence adherence. I think that as our later slides will show, the rates of non-adherence 
increase with time, and I think immediately after transplant, it's so exciting, right? It's like having a newborn baby. Every change of the diaper is some new adventure, right? And then it gets old after time. And the challenge is, like, what do you do in order to make people take their medicines after they've been doing it for a long period of time? And I like to think about, like, getting your medications by mail order on a routine basis. If something comes to your home in a package, um, routinely and it's just there and available, are you going to take it more likely than if you have to go to Publix once a month and pick it up? And then if you go to your pharmacy and like, that medicine's ready for you, but this one's not ready and you can't pick it up for ne another couple days, you know, that definitely kind of impacts the persistence adherence. Andrea, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. So I have to tell you guys a story about, um, about 90 day medications. Um, I had a patient tell me that she had switched all of her medications over to 90 days because it helped her and she got her medications by mail. But when she told me that, she said to me, she said, Santa Claus brings my medicines. And I said, sorry, what, excuse me? And she said, oh yeah, don't you know, Amazon's a new Santa Claus. He just shows up at my house every day. And I was like, well now that I can remember. That I'm happy to remember because we all need an Amazon, right? So it's true, you know, you have to figure out what, what works for you. So I, we've been kind of looking at these slides and going over these slides um, for a while now. And I'm really glad that it was my turn to get to this slide because this is my favorite slide ever. So if you remember nothing else from this talk today, I want you to really look at this slide and I want you to really think about what it says. Um, so our renal transplant recipients are prone to non-adherence for a lot of reasons, but one of the big reasons is because of the complexity of their immunosuppressive uh, regimen. So non-adherence for our patients um, accounts for a five-year graph, a decreased five-year graph loss. Non-adherence uh, for our patients makes uh, a seven-time fold higher graph loss. And the last one is what really spoke to me because over half of our graft losses are due to rejection. So think about that. Here we are, we've, we've gone through, we've got, we've got them in, we've got them, eva the evaluation went smooth as, smooth as could be. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we've got, the surgery was great, they're happy, they're taking their medications, and our, our numbers look good. We've transplanted 400 patients this year, and 200 of those are going to lose their graft because of, uh, because of rejection and non-adherence to their medicines. I mean, my heart just kind of dropped when I, when I saw that. I mean, we know it happens, but I mean, when I saw that number, I just thought, oh, good gracious, what am, how are we going to fix this? What are we going to do? So um, I just thought that that was a really profound statistic um, for us to kind of tattoo up here to try to see what we could do to help our patients with adherence post-transplant to prevent graft loss. Um, this next slide um, tells us it was a Kaplan-Myers uh, analyst of graft survival. And what it really says basically is that adherent patients versus non-adherent patients um, were 84 and 98% respectively um, when compared to each group with over two years. So I definitely am not going to read this slide to you, but I think again it just speaks to the the kind of complexity of factors that impact adherence and non-adherence. And just to give some examples from some of the categories, we have socioeconomic factors, patient-related factors, disease-related factors, treatment-related factors, and healthcare-related factors. Um, I think age. We're going to speak to this on another slide, but definitely age does matter, and you see different rates of adherence, particularly in the pediatric population, and we'll show some data on that. For patient-related, um, I think the thing that's most impactful for us is, you know, the lack of knowledge and how patients absorb information. So Andrea alluded to our orange and white booklet. Um, the, we made you know, a lot of attempts to keep this at the sixth grade reading level and to have all of our care providers refer back to the booklet. So you know, 
the booklet, the booklet, the booklet. And I think that it really does help just because the patients kind of know where to go for the information. We try to make the information patient friendly. But what if you have an illiterate patient? for example. So they're not going to go to the booklet. So they have to have another way to get their information. Um, in terms of disease-related and what we screen for on the pre-transplant side, um, I would say most impactful is psychiatric symptoms. So if they have anxiety, depression, or substance abuse, we do know that this is going to be um, impactful for them in terms of adherence, and it could be early on after transplant. So transplant, again, I'll kind of... Um, an analogy to having a new baby. Everybody's pretty excited, right? But it's also super stressful. You have this new thing that you're supposed to take care of. You have new medications that you could be having side effects from. And not everybody feels great after having a kidney transplant. Some patients, it takes them weeks to months to recover and really feel like this is something that they did for themselves that was a positive thing, to be honest with you. And so I think that a lot of times if they have problems with anxiety or depression, transplant the actual surgery and post-transplant process can, can make those symptoms worse. And we need to make sure that we can do everything possible before transplant to put them in a good situation so that those um, things can be addressed because we know it's going to impact their adherence. Um, for treatment-related, cost of medications is a big thing, you know. So patients on the pre-transplant side, if they do um, copay, analysis, so sometimes we have them fill out a worksheet for an expense worksheet so that they know what they're getting themselves into. Um, that's super helpful so that they can plan accordingly and it's not a shock to them why they're trying to recover from surgery. Um, and then lastly, for the healthcare related, I think just the quality of the um, patient provider relationship, and this is something again that I just really value Andrea because she's so friendly. You know, she's so approachable. I feel like, the, you know, it's not this um, class tower situation where people are coming in and seeing Andrea and she's telling them what to do and you know it's a relationship she has a conversation with people and I think Drew mentioned the telemedicine so she has telemed visits with patients all the time from their home and you know in their home environment she's talking to them she finds out stuff about them she develops that relationship in turn because she knows about them they trust her Right, and they will go to Andrea and Tom. I've heard people tell me Andrea did their surgery, you know, and I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I don't think Andrea or I could begin to cut you open to for a surgery, you know. Um, but that's the way that they see her because of that relationship. And I think that having, you know, a limited number of nurse practitioners that's involved in our long-term care has helped us in that regard greatly. Um, so. When we look at kidney transplant specifically, we have the highest rates of non-adherence. Um, so this looked at one study and um, cases of non-adherence, persons per 100 person per year. And they looked at all come rates, so around 23. Um, and then kidney, heart, liver, kidney, pancreas, and lung heart. And you can see that the kidney transplant by far had the highest rates of non-adherence. And I think everybody in the room can kind of attest to why you think that that is. I think part of it is that heart and liver patients, a lot of them when they come in for transplant, they're actually coming in from an inpatient status and probably an ICU status. And they know that they could die without that organ functioning, right? So that's a big motivator to be adherent for sure. Um, but any other thoughts on why kidney might have higher rates in, of non-adherence. Yes, sir. So don't throw me out for asking a second question. <laughs> but this one is related to non-adherence. My insurance, I work at Advocate Christ Medical Center, is the same as a co-worker I transplanted last month. Her and Varsa's prescription was denied by my insurance. Her insurance is the same as mine. So I think, you know, that is a problem, my coordinator got her the month's supply of Envarsis, and then I have to write a letter to my own insurance company, United Healthcare. Go figure that, you know, I think this is a better formulation of Tectrolimus. So do you see that in your population? We're on the south side of Chicago, and it's a big problem. So I think I can speak to that, uh, be working on the post side. So uh, a lot of times we, we really encourage our patients because most of them have Medicare, 
Um, we usually encourage our patients to use two pharmacies that we're, we really work closely with, especially for the first three months that are specialty pharmacies because they know how to bill those medications. Uh, a lot of times when they go back to uh, their local pharmacies, they're billing their immunosuppressive medications through Medicare Part D instead of B as in boy. And our coordinators and social workers and pharmacists work in conjunction together to make sure that they have the medications and that they're being billed right. Very rarely do we have to do a peer-to-peer -peer interview to get any of that covered because we all work together to make sure that they have been, uh, there's been a prior ARTH or anything like that taken care of before. Another thing that's very successful and helpful with us is that the two uh, specialty pharmacies that we work with often will bring the patient's, well they do, every, every discharge, correct? They bring the patient's medicines to the room before they're discharged, so they have all of their medicines before they're even discharged. So we make sure that all that's taken care of. And our coordinators endlessly, work endlessly on the phone to make sure that all of that is taken care of. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Charlie Thomas, and I am pleasantly a retired transplant social worker. <clears throat> uh, retired this last year. Um, and thank you for your talk. I was actually a guest speaker to your program some years ago to both the Atlanta and the Savannah uh, locations. Um, one of the things that I learned early in my career about how to predict who might become non-compliant or not adherent with the medicines, it was a, there was a short study out of Montefiore in New York that identified higher education, sense of invulnerability, and younger like age and professional age, that there was a sense of invulnerability separate from the other factors that you've identified. And uh, we found that helpful in working with, with folks that we consider to be high risk for adherence. So education, higher income, sense of invincibility, and nothing will happen. All right. Um, if I may add to what Charlie said, uh, I didn't realize he was going to be speaking because he was over my shoulder and I didn't see him. But um, I'm a three-time recipient, two livers and a kidney, and I do a lot of support work um, at UCLA and USC in California. And I think one of the explanations for the um, poor adherence by kidney is the longevity. They're trained. Um, when you spend several years of your life in a particular adaptive lifestyle, um, you start perceiving vulnerability and those issues differently than someone who suddenly <clears throat> has a heart attack or suddenly has a, a, a liver condition because um, they're going to face life and death really quick. And so they don't get used to the idea of being trained that, uh, well, this is just my new lifestyle. And some of these folks that you're measuring at that 34 level on your graph have been living this way for a decade and more. And most of your heart or uh, <clears throat> liver patients you're, you may be talking weeks or months. Um, I went through it multiple times, but my first time, it was two weeks. Uh, I'd never been in a hospital. They tell me I got a liver problem, and two weeks later, I'm transplanted. Um, you look at things differently than somebody who's been enduring for uh, a number of years. So it's hard to put a handle on it, but I think that's what is happening. Okay, so I want to take a look at this study. This study uh, of adherence with immunosuppressive medications was done in the Netherlands. Uh, we know that, um, well, uh, per the study, uh, non-adherence increases over time in post-transplant period. So um, you can see at baseline, 17% were non-adherents, or, or 17 patients out of uh, 113. Uh, move on to six months and 27 patients admit to non-adherence. 
and at 18 months, 31% of patients uh, in adult kidney transplant patients were non-adherent. So this really solidifies, solidifies what we've been talking about, that over time, patients become a little settled in and maybe are, you know, that, that newborn baby's kind of wearing off a lot, right? And this study here was the one that I alluded to. So I'm an adult transplant nephrologist. And I've never worked with pediatric patients, but I had the pleasure at one of the AST, it was called a patient summit at the time. So they had two representatives from each state come and talk about, and it was kidney, liver, heart recipients, kind of talk about different issues um, that they felt were important and felt were challenges um, in their transplant course. And there was a wonderful panel by some pediatric recipients. And they talked about, particularly being their age group, what they found difficult about transplantation. You could see on the left-hand side that if you're less than 10 years old, the rate of it non-adherence about 22%, and it nearly doubles in adolescence, so those aged 10 to 19 years. And even young adults, they actually had very high rates in a separate study of non-adherence at two out of three young adults aged 20 to 30 being non-adherent. And the group of adolescents that I heard speak were in the 10 to 19 year range. And there was a panel of them up. I, th I thought that they were so brave, honestly. There was just hundreds of people in the room, including transplant professionals, to learn from them. And one of them spoke to the fact that when you're a teenager, you have a lot of extracurricular activities. So you could be in volleyball, sports, you could be in drama, you know, play an instrument. I personally drive a bus for a ballerina and a gymnast, so I get it, you know? And she said that it was really hard for her at first. If it was time for her to take her medication at 7 p.m., it was hard for her to just stop doing what she was doing and take her medicines. Number one, because she was doing something, and number two, because her friends would know that she had had a transplant needs to take medication. And they talked about the challenges of like getting over those things. And you know, she said, I just figured I gotta live, I gotta do what's right for me. And I just told my friends, this is what I do. So I go take a swig of water, take my pills, get back to what I'm doing. And that's really brave of her. But you can imagine, I mean, we all were teenagers, how awkward that period is, right? And then the, have the special impact, the additional impact of being a transplant recipient. So I think a lot of this is very well known and there's things that I'm sure the pediatric community does to address this. We find that there's troubles with the transition, right? So you have transition from our pediatric hospital is CHOA and they come to see us and they're like, wow, there's not an hour long visit with my parent in the room, you know? They're not prepared for how the adult kind of feel happens. And I think that a lot of times that transition period could also be an important point at which interventions that we can do to, to improve adherence. Yes, sir. So <clears throat> we never, well, I, we did peds in Pittsburgh, but in Tampa we did adolescents. We did pediatric kidneys, but we did livers, adolescents. And so one of the things you pointed out, I don't want to have to take my meds in front of my friends because then they'll know I had a chance, but it's the elephant in the room. So one of the things I did, and we didn't have a ton of adolescents, but whenever I could, I asked them to bring one of their friends to the, one of their early clinic visits. And then I helped get the elephant out of the room nice. because they don't want to answer these questions because they don't know how. And the other thing that that provides is it reverses the peer pressure because in that group of patients, they want to be normal, which I always, when I've done talks for pediatric patients, I always put a slide up, somebody making a weird face and saying, if you're in a room of abnormal people, who's normal and who's not? There's no such thing as normal, right? But what that does is when they understand how important it is for them to take their meds, it applies positive peer pressure from their friends to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to. Yes. All right, and then adherence, just another kind of way to look at it with medications is the complexity of the medication regimen. So this study looked at how likely someone was to take their medication if it was a morning dose versus an evening dose. And adherence to the morning dose was about 88%. 
And that dropped with the evening dose at 77%. And, you know, we all know this is true, right? So when are you most likely to exercise, get in a good meal, do, you know, drink your water? If you do this by starting right in the morning, it's more likely to happen than during the day. And definitely medication as well is one of these things that's affected by the time. All right. Andrea, I'll switch to you. So we know that non-adherence is a, a big part of getting our patients to have their graph and uh, graph survive longer. So what behaviors direct to non-adherence? So uh, do we measure these by uh, non-responsive to treatment outcomes? Are they canceling their appointments? Have you called them 10 times to get their labs done and you still got the big goose egg? Nada? Nothing? Um, Pre-transplant adherence. Um, you know, this can, this, and let me allude back to the age thing. This can be a real issue as well. Um, back in my very younger years, I have to say, um, I had a patient who was uh, 14 when she started dialysis. And there was no way on God's green earth that anybody was going to stick her in her fistula. It just wasn't happening. You could forget it. I can't, can't, I can't tell you how many times I chased that kid down outside of the dialysis center to have her butt come sit in that dialysis chair. Lo and behold, finally, after we sat on her a blue million times, she finally let two people in the dialysis clinic stick her. I'm going to tell you this because it's a positive story. You might think it's not, but it is. The kid went on and had two children on dialysis. How many, how many people have seen that? That's what I thought. See, I was amazed too. Now, um, we transplanted her about six years ago, and she never would go on the transplant list because she was like, I'm not taking that prednisone. It's going to make me fat. It's going to make me fat. I'm not taking it. We finally transplanted her, and she's, she's doing well. I have to call her every now and then. She calls me mama. She, her parents were a little... Not, not very, not very helpful. So our dialysis center used to go together and buy our Christmas. Every now and then I have to call her and say, hey, don't have any labs here. What's going on? And she'll come get her labs done. But, you know, it's things like that. You guys don't know that you're doing it, but you are. And those patients are going to remember you. And that kind of goes back to adherence on dialysis, right? So it took, her, it took her a while, 20 years to be exact, but she finally got to that transplant stage. Um, so how do you screen for potential risk of non-adherence prior to transplantation? Is that where we're at? Yeah. So um, dialysis, hemoglobin A1C, uh, encourage your treatments. Um, what else did I miss? One of the things that, uh, that we've been discussing with the local nephrologists is that there's this push to refer patients for a transplant, right? It's a renewed um, focus on that, which I think is appropriate. There's a lot of times that people that were appropriate for transplant weren't being referred. But the flip side to that is that if you're referring everybody, you're going to see more people that transplant's not appropriate for. And one thing that might be really hard to miss is the patient that's not going to be adherent post-transplant. So they could look great in every other way but not be able to follow the complex medical regimen. And so with our relationship with the nephrologist, uh, we like to pose it that we, this could be a potential win-win situation. So if there's a patient that they have concerns about with adherence, um, they might want to reach out to us and we could say with the patient, you know, we're concerned about you being a transplant candidate because you're really not showing up for dialysis, so we need proof that you're going to be able to do what you need to do to take care of a transplant, and that's how we assess that. And there's been several patients that we've been able to improve their dialysis adherence. Sometimes they just give up on dialysis, right? They don't show up because they don't see the end point. But if you say, if you are able to do it and do it better, then we can get you listed for a transplant. You can get a transplant. It's a win for everybody, most importantly, the patient. They get better dialysis treatment while they're waiting. We know that they can do what they need to do. And then after transplant, they have a successful outcome. So we've done that with some of our local nephrologists, just working with them. And, and that really is very, very helpful. Um, so post-transplant, you know, I think we've touched on a lot of these factors, and so in the interest of time, we'll skip this slide um, just to, to
to talk about the different ways that you can screen um, people for adherence post-transplant. So very interested to hear your own center's experience, what works, what doesn't work with how we can screen people for adherence. I think uh, Andrea alluded to the fact that Rose and the other three transplant pharmacists at our program do a ton of work with patients in the post-transplant period just to look at adherence. So, you know, go through pillbox, build the pillbox with them at the time of hospital discharge. Look at their pillbox when they come in for the first couple transplant visits. Then they have a kind of scoring system so that if the pillbox is perfect, they don't necessarily need a follow-up visit. But if it's not perfect, they will continue to see them until it is. And then they see them at regular intervals, so three and six months out from transplant when we might be stopping some of the antiviral and the PJP prophylaxis medicines. You know, that's a good touch point as well as well as an annual visit. So, you know, I really am grateful for our PharmDs because they do a lot in terms of letting us know too in clinic, this person's struggling, they don't know their medications, or they're doing great, everything's perfect. You know, that just helps the provider know how much time we need to do to focus our efforts with that patient as well. And then they know that we're a collaborative team, that we're actually taking care of them together. Um, other ways that you can look, so if they're on an IV um, immunosuppression medication, you can make sure that they're showing up to the infusion center. In Epic, that's super nice. We can just look to see what ones they showed up for. Um, for Andrea's case, like long-term care, if their prograph levels are consistently less than three, you know, that might be an indication that they're not taking it um, or that they need a reinforcement about their, their appropriate dose. So interventions that can help improve adherence, first of all, is to identify it, right? So what is the issue and what are the causative factors? And one thing that Andrea does beautifully is to ask non-confrontationally about barriers to adherence. So, you know, my gut reaction when I see a low to Carlomus level, for example, would be like, why are they taking their medicine right, right? So really, like if somebody feels that they're being attacked or judged, um, when we identify an issue, it's not going to help them get better. They're going to get prickly, right? They're going to get defensive and kind of walled off. So to ask, you know, oh, I noticed that this level is low, you know, what dose are you taking? How are you taking it? You know, stuff like that. And then if they're, they might tell you, oh, I ran out because I couldn't afford or whatever. And then to be equipped with the tools in which you can actually help them. You know, I think that that really goes miles and just to, to remember like, okay, there's a lot of different things that can be going on with this patient. How can I help them? Um, Andrew has this great story about prednisone, and so she sees on her end that a lot of patients don't know why they're taking prednisone. And then they might be seeing their primary care doctor and being like, or somebody, and says, why are you, or orthopedics, why are you on prednisone? That's going to disintegrate your bones. Um, you shouldn't take that anymore. Okay, I guess I'll stop taking it, right? So, um, you know, educating them, no, prednisone is one of your three anti-rejection medicines. We don't want it to be stopped if you're going to if somebody advises you, please call and talk to us about that. Um, simplification of regimen is huge, and then use of a medication system, either a pill box or reminders to take the medication can really help. So tools and technology, um, I think, you know, we rely very heavily on the pill box as well as a checklist. And any way that you can make this more easy on you and the patient is great. So for example, our PharmDs use a medication uh, like list that we give to the patients that's part of a program that doesn't interface yet with Epic. So every time that a change was made in Epic, our pharmacists had to go in and change it in the other system to print it out for the patient. And they're working right now in order to make it seamless so that if we make a change in Epic, they can just print a new med sheet for that patient. And that's a small but mighty thing, you know? So anything that you can do at your program in order to make sure that the patient always has an accurate med list. That sounds silly, right? But it really is super important. And I have to tell you guys, those patients covet that med list that has the picture why you're taking it, what you're taking it for, and how long. I have people come to see me all the time a year out, and it looks like, it looks, it, I mean, scratches everywhere. And they're like, hey, can you get me another one of those lists with the pictures on it? Sure. I mean, they love it. They love that. 
Um, and then electronic reminders. Somebody, when we were just getting ready for this session, said that Alexa reminds um, his child about taking a medication. You know, my kid loves Alexa. If my kid was taking a medication and Alexa told her to take her meds, she'd be much more likely to take it than mom telling her the same thing. To be honest with you, she'd be like, that's so cool, Alexa's telling me. Um, so again, just brainstorming different ideas of how you can get your patients to remember their medications. So in summary, uh, kidney transplant recipients, uh, I think that there's a difference in, um, oh, did you have, yes. yes, sir. Yeah, one question I have is that uh, when you change medicine uh, in between visits, like you go from two and two to two and one, and then week later, patient gets a new bottle from the pharmacy, which still says two and two. Mm -hmm. So that is sometimes we feel a problem that patient feels, thinks that my, doctor has changed it and then they go back to the previous dose. So how do you uh, counteract that? So d definitely using that medication list, we encourage them when they have a change to write it on that list that they have um, and to t teach them go by that list instead right. of the bottles from the pharmacy and then again to check the dose. Because oftentimes the dose will be sent the same from the pharmacy, but just to be used to their doses as well and a medication list like that that has the milligram doses is gonna be super helpful. Um, another thing is to look at changes for pill size, you know, so different pills if they're different milligram dose might be different size or colors, um, and that's helpful as well. Um, all right, so in summary, we talked kind of at the beginning of the talk about the difference between the short-term and the long-term outcomes out from transplant, and then we kind of went into non-adherence specifically, how common it is after transplant, so anywhere between a third to two-thirds of our patients having adherence issues out from transplant, and a lot of that adherence issue being non-intentional non-adherence. Um, I think Andrea spoke about her favorite slide with the risk of non-adherence and early graft loss um, and the impact on long-term graft function. You know, she said something really impactful where we spend so much time and energy getting the patient to transplant, right? The surgeons do a great job operating and all of that, if the adherence isn't there, um, really diminishes the amount of time that that patient's gonna live and enjoy graft function. Um, and then just think about how you and at your center with all of the, you know, advantages that you have as well as maybe challenges, how you can really partner with your community nephrologists in order to maximize long-term graft uh, patient outcomes um, and graft care. So with that, any closing comments or questions from the group? Great talk, by the way. Thank uh, you. Do you educate recipients who receive a living donor organ, specifically from a family member, any differently than someone who may have received a deceased organ? Uh, because I can only imagine that if I donated directly to somebody, uh, there's a dynamic there, and I don't know if that recipient would be more compelled to, you know, to have adherence, or I, I just could see that being potentially problematic in a family type setting. Right, so people that are scheduled for a living donor transplant, um, they do have a pre-op visit and we do start some of the education at that time because, you know, for a deceased donor transplant recipient, we're giving them their booklet and starting the education. They get a little bit during their annual visits to our center on the wait list, uh, but for the most part, they're getting their education starting when they're still on a PCA, you know, it's not ideal. And so for a living donor recipient, we give them the booklet, we give them the medication list, we give them everything, and we really encourage them to start learning about the post-care, um, you know, a certain number of pages through the booklet before they are transplanted because they're awake alert, they can absorb the information better than immediately after surgery. Oh yes, and we also do, well that's for living donors and deceased donors, but we do do an education class um, during the hospital visit as well as the one-on-one -on -one education as well. But living donors specifically is the pre-transplant, pre-op visit that we spend a lot of time on the education piece. So, first I'd like to say thanks for doing this. Uh, as a patient and a pharmacist, uh, it still is one of the most important things to help us get that long-term care 
and long-term survival. Um, and you showed that in some of the data. And a lot of those papers, when they define non-adherence, they use the 80-20 rule, right? Missing 20% of the doses. And we know that in transplant, that's probably too broad of a definition and it needs to be tighter. So the, the impact is probably worse than what the studies show. True. Um, the second thing I would like to say is you started to point to the fact that medication non-adherence or even therapy non-adherence is not just because of the patients, right? But the one thing I want to emphasize is healthcare communication to a patient is a big issue with some of that non-adherence. And everybody in this room has probably had patients where they left clinic with their new after visit summary and came back the next time and weren't following the way that the after visit summary told them to do. Or you made a phone call when you got labs back and made three changes in their meds. Right? And they come to clinic the next time and they either didn't do any of them or they did them wrong because we don't have a great feedback system for them to tell us that they understood what we wanted them to do. So I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, of course, we have nurses that room the patients and they do the med rec and that sort of thing. I pretend like they don't because there's no reason for me not to go through their medications again. Every now and then I'll get somebody that says, well, the nurse just did that. Yes, ma'am, I know, but I want to make sure that I'm aware of what you're, going, what you're taking. And more often than not, they will either have forgotten something or they'll say, oh, I told her wrong. Or, I mean, it's just like a doctor, doctor APP relationship, right? I'll go in, they'll tell me something, then she'll come in and they'll tell, she'll, they'll tell her, they're like, is that bubbly doctor with the, the curly hair coming in? They'll tell her a whole different story. It's the same thing with the mechanic, right? Your car never, never does anything when you take it to them. So I think it's, uh, you know, a repetitive situation where not only are they getting their meds done with the pharmacist, not all the time, but sometimes on the same day. They're getting the med rec, rec done with uh, the nurse. And then I know all three of us APPs that see the patients in the clinic, we go over their medications again. Then once we make changes, if any, our coordinators are gonna call them and go over that again. So most of the time they're getting three or four med recs done when they come in our clinic. Any other thoughts or questions? All right, well again, thank you very much to Veloxis for sponsoring this. And I think that y'all, by being here, I mean, it goes a long way. It shows that you're really committed and um, I appreciate you all being here. Thank you.